good, then uh, we get started and kick this puppy off. So um, I wanted to uh, welcome everyone to our panel here, the creativity, burnout, and mental health when the world still sucks. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce everybody here. Um, we have um, Ewen Ma. Um, Ewen writes uh, speculative fiction and poetry. Uh, their work can be found in Uncanny, The Deadlands, Fusion Fragment, Anathema, and Apparition Lit, among others. Um, and they have been shortlisted for the inaugural Future Worlds Prize in 2020. So welcome, Ellen. Congratulations on all that. Awesome. Um, we also have um, Vale Solomon. Um, Vale is an author of mostly queer and short speculative fiction. They also have experience ghostwriting and giving tarot, oracle, and curio readings, which I thought was very interesting. <laughs> Come Vale. Uh, <laughs> next, we have um, Maria Schrader. Her work has appeared in Sycorax Journal. Am I saying that properly? Um, and the air and nothingness presses wild hunt and future perfect in past tense anthologies. She's also an associate editor for apparition literary magazine. Welcome Maria. Thank you. Um, last, but not least 1st to arrive too, we have Merck. Moore. Merck is the author of several short story collections and the novella, the wolf among the wild hunt um, that released in 2021. They have a short stories and they have short stories published in uh, Lightspeed, Fireside, Nightmare, Apex, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, Escape Pod, Uncanny, and many others. So welcome, Merck. And we're happy to have all of you here. Um, and I guess we'll just I'm gonna throw a couple questions out and we'll go from there, see how it goes. I'll try and keep an eye on the Discord too for everyone. Um, to keep an eye out for questions um, for all of you. So um, I would say uh, the first question I had for all of you was, um, how has your writing or your creative process, if not writing, like changed uh, since, I, I would say 2020, I'm gonna use as the benchmark um, pandemic wise, is probably what they had in mind when they created this. Um, like, has there been a noticeable change in your structure your schedule, anything like that. Anybody? Well, uh, in January of 2020, I moved to a totally different state. <laughs> so <laughs> that kind of shook everything up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, ignoring the obvious thing that shook everything up. <laughs> um, no, uh, I found that honestly, not a lot has changed for me, even in. 2020 because I am jumping on the mental health side of this. I am agoraphobic. I'm also disabled. So not leaving the house is not a new thing for me. <laughs> Watching other people be stressed out was harder for me than being stressed out myself. So it was like that kind of impacted things a little bit more than anything else. Yeah. Yeah, I actually also moved the uh, very end of so like December 2019 into 2020. So that was so like when 2020 hit, it was like, oh, <laughs> a little bit more stress. Um, but I would say I, I feel like it's honestly probably just my processes has gotten slower. Overall, it's uh, not writing as much, or I guess the pace is a slower just of choosing projects or producing on different projects. I feel like it takes more energy nowadays than possibly before in the pre pandemic days. I definitely agree with that. Um, Owen or Maria, um, anything? It can be little things too, like, um, um I can't well, even. Yeah. I actually moved twice, three times from. Hong Kong to the UK and back again, and then back to the UK again throughout the past two years. So it kind of didn't have no noticeable like impact, I guess, or maybe I just didn't notice it as much. But then there was also the fact that in 2019, something like really, really catastrophic happened 
back in my hometown that kind of already kicked off this sense of being in a pandemic. So it was like just another thing added to the list, I guess. So I didn't have noticeable change in a way, right? But then I did became more like conscious of where I put my energy into things and kind of had to sit back a bit and figure out like, okay, which projects I'm more passionate about and which I wanted to see completed sooner and work on those. So yeah, I guess there's that. I, I agree that with way. everyone. Uh, as far as just like, you know, uh, slowing down, I've definitely had um, just more periods where it's just like, I, I had a lot of trouble accessing creativity, which actually um, for about the last month has, has been kind of been really hitting me. Um, we came off of the last reading period for apparition and I was just sort of like, oh, and now I have to write for myself. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to do that anymore. Um, so de definitely just backing up what everyone else has said. It's been, yeah, it's been a rough few years. Agreed. <laughs> yep. Um, so that being said, um, uh, what I'm hearing is uh, what it, I've felt myself is that, um, slower output and maybe a little more discerning in product uh, projects that you take on. Um, have you all um, used anything like any apps or um, just any tools, mental tools, um, anything that maybe you didn't use before to kind of help you navigate through the, the stress of that? Maybe even just, you know, uh, I know as a writer feeling an anxiety when you can't use or you feel like you can't access that creativity, like you said, Maria, um, there's like a huge amount of anxiety over that. So is there anything that you all have done that either one, help you get through that anxiety or help you overcome it in a way? I'm a dog. <laughs> yep. I am, I'm not a dog person at all. I'm very much a cat person. I have two cats, um, but my partner has desperately wanted a dog. and. I've been working from home since um, 2020 and I, I, I like it, but I'm also uh, a very anxious person who won't walk around outside by myself at all for basically any reason. And I was reading a lot about how much physical, like taking care of yourself physically can affect your mental health. And I was definitely kind of stewing in my own anxiety a little bit. So trying to figure out how to make myself take care of myself physically. I was like, well, I think the best solution is to get a dog because then I have to go and walk. And then like, we got a big dog. He's eight months old and already like 60 pounds. So oh, RIP me. <laughs> uh, so, so there's definitely like a sense of security with him, although he's a little bit of a wild child, so. We can try for one second. Can I ask what kind of dog you have? Oh, he's like he's such a uh, just a mutt. He's the most dog dog ever. You just look at him, and you're like, yeah, that's a dog. Everyone's been like, he's a pit bull. He's a golden retriever. He's a, you know everything. He's a good side. boy. He's a good boy, boy. Most of the time. <laughs> okay, sorry. I just needed to, to divert the conversation for that one second. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. No, I have no idea what he is. He's he's brown and white. <laughs> it's kind of the best description of a dog. I don't know. He's brown. <laughs> so, any anyone else, or is it just kind of like, oh, we dealt with it? <laughs> I feel like I tried to use more planners, but it just didn't do much. <laughs> I started them, and then, like, I set it down somewhere and immediately forget. But I had this planner I was trying to use. So <laughs> I've had similar experience with planners. I have a whole shelf of them, and they're pretty. Yeah, the, I love looking at it. I just yeah. never use it. <laughs> um, I guess like everyone else during the pandemic, I tried meditation, 
keyboard tried because those never work for me. I can only manage like three, four minutes tops before I like um quit. But it was kind of useful while it lasted, but then I'm not sure how sustainable it is as a everyday practice, especially for someone who's ADHD like me. So yeah, just that. Oh. <laughs> I think it helps to hear, um, even if maybe you don't feel you have anything like that was super productive for you, it probably helps others to hear that, oh, I tried that and it didn't work, you know? <laughs> um, so you know, were kind of on the same uh, boat in that respect, trying things, you know, trying to get there. So <laughs> is there yeah. anything you wanted to add to that or should we? Um, I like writing sprints in theory. I really do. They make me happy. I have dice that I will occasionally roll to give me a number to try and write for. Does it work? Eh. 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 <laughs> it's slowly getting out of powder's yeah. brain. <laughs> Is this like a D100 so, or? <laughs> like, it's, what I'll do is I'll either try and pick a number or I'll, uh, uh, pick a number to aim for or pick a number to uh, time set time to write for and it's like neither one of these really work for me but i love them in theory like give me that sweet sweet pomodoro action and i'd love right. to have it work for me <laughs> it does not that is my main thing that i try and get done um beyond that like i try i've tried planners and stuff like that and i still try them um but honestly the the main things that I just kind of keep doing are going back to like making random Scrivener documents with various notes and things and hoping maybe I'll remember it this time. Yeah, I feel that deep in my soul. <laughs> Many enough, you know, like planners and notebooks haven't worked for me, but like scrap paper does. Like I'll be at work and I'll just have like, I literally have like the back of a D&D &D character sheet that I've like written a poem on like longhand that I just did. It's like, why couldn't that go in the notebook where it's beautiful and I won't lose it immediately. <laughs> That's pressure maybe. <laughs> and the dog won't eat it probably. The notebook judges you, that's why. The scrap paper has nothing, no room to judge. Exactly. That's very true. There's so much less pressure in the back of a napkin than there is in a nice <laughs> journal. <laughs> I kind of subscribe to the idea that if like something isn't working, just try to take it in a new direction. So like write on scrap paper or get like a washable, like, you know, marker board or something. Or um, I started, I picked up uh, embroidery recently as something else to do with my hands. That was like, it's not. It is like, you know, I do have to concentrate on it to make sure I'm not putting the needle in the wrong spot, but it's not the same level of like creative thought and concentration that I have to do for writing. And I can just do it while I'm, you know, watching TV or listening to a podcast or something and sort of stimulating, you know, the brain in other ways. Um, so because I'm stuck inside all day, I'm definitely trying to change it up a lot as far as like what what my habits and routine are because I am a creature of habit and routine but I can wear those grooves really deep yeah and speaking of podcasts I've also been listening to a lot of podcasts and audiobooks these days you know, it's like I find it's really really helpful to do chores or like just take a walk or just I don't know just hang out in a room or listening to a story without having to read it on page, I guess, even though it's completely different from reading in like the texture of it, like the texture of the book. But then there's also this like sense that you can just let the story flow through your mind. I find it really, really soothing in a way. Yeah, yeah I've been listening, to, I listen to a lot of nonfiction audiobooks. Uh, on my commute to to work and back so that has been definitely I feel like I've been reading a lot more nonfiction that way which has been I think helpful um, because it like yeah when 2020 kind of hit like my reading habits just like knows that it was really hard to read anything I can did I had the same thing by the way a total reading slump I don't know why I'd pick up a book and then it would just 
just couldn't get into it. But I know you asked earlier. Sorry, go on. No, no worries. You this is your oh. panel. <laughs> I was gonna say was I know you asked earlier about what had what had changed in our writing, but honestly, my reading changed a lot more. Yeah, definitely. That's almost comforting to hear in a way. And probably <laughs> people watching this. <laughs> really, I went, you know, I'm a writer, right? Why? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I struggle with audiobooks because if I'm doing anything else with my hands or anything, I'm so good at tuning things out. And I think it's from growing up with four other siblings. It's just like I can just shut it off. So I'll come back and I'm like a chapter later. I'm like, ah, oh, damn it. And I have to rewind <laughs> completely. So I listen to a lot of like D&D, &D, like Let's Play podcasts because it's just sort of like the babble of a bunch of different voices is fun. But I've had a lot more success with just reading short fiction online, and part of it is probably getting involved with apparition. It forces me to, um, you know, once a quarter I have to read, you know, a couple hundred short stories and poems and stuff. But for whatever reason, the bite-sized chunks and having it on my phone has been a lot easier for me, where I can just sort of pick it up and put it down and get through it in 20 minutes. Whereas a novel, it's like, I'm making a real commitment here. Right. <laughs> I guess one app that I did end up using a little bit more is the Pocket. So I could save links to like short stories to the Pocket app and then, you know, if I remember, but bring them up later. And that was, I, I think it took a little bit more pressure off to like, I need to read the story immediately right now while I'm on the computer. Um, so that, that helped a little bit with like short fiction reading um, just to have that like, oh yeah, I can always come back to it. Kitty, kitty. the app pocket. I've never heard of that actually. I believe it's. I feel like it's just it's just called pocket or pocket app. I forget. Um, I know the app. Like I think it's just called right. pocket. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, you can Firefox, right? Somebody, Somebody already browsers or mobile. Sorry. They're so good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, well, I, I'm glad I'm not alone there. I'm sure lots of people are as well. Um, I, I did have another question and, um, I was really curious about your all answers to this, um, was how have you surprised yourself in these last 2 years and or few years? Um, I know it's not. Um, exclusively the pandemic, we have a lot of things going on in our lives, but, um, uh, how have you surprised yourself in your. Creative spaces, or how has a friend or sort of colleague in the industry done something that you're like, man, I wish I'd thought of that, or that is such a good redirect, or, um, or, or wow, just persevering through something and then coming out with a story, or, or, I mean, um, you mentioned uh, Maria taking up, uh, um, writing, yeah, and, um, you know, like things like that. You're like, I never thought I would do that, you know. Um, do, do any of you have anything like that or a story from a friend that's done something that just impressed the hell out of you? <laughs> oh, kind of a tough question. Sorry. <laughs> I'm like, sorry. <laughs> deep you. And you're like, gosh, I didn't prepare. Um, Try um, making kombucha. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not related to writing, but just sort of, um, spreading spreading my wings a little bit more. I graduated from college in 2018, so I was barely into sort of like my professional life when the pandemic hit. Um, so I think the things that I'm proud of is I finished writing a novel, which I'm hoping to query soon. Thank you. And I got involved with Apparition and I think 2020, um, time isn't real. And being on the editing side, really changed a lot of things for me as far as like um my own craft it definitely taught me a lot about like what makes a good hook for a short story what are general trends that i'm seeing how does a story carry me along and also sort of like what are my biases because um i'm an ex-catholic but i'm still like very fond of the pomp and circumstance so if you send me a story about sad angels i'm like yes and everyone else has to be like maria no too much Um, it's kind of more like a tool basic, but I did end up getting a taller table that can function as a standing desk. 
and also a raised chair. So I I found that that when I am able to like sit down and work, it it's been really helpful to have like that sort of posture standing more than um, sitting lower. And I feel like I'm in working mode when I'm like at the standing desk instead of you know sitting on the couch or something. So I I like it. Working mode for me is shoes. If I have shoes on, then I'm actually doing something. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to really, sorry, go on. Yeah, I took up hiking. Thus, like before the pandemic hit, I barely went out. I barely like went off the house or even just like to take a walk because like I love being indoors. I'm an indoors person. But then since the pandemic hit, I've been craving outdoors so much that I kind of like researched like hiking routes around like Hong Kong and also around the UK and just went out and spent a couple of hours, maybe, maybe during sunset or um, sunrise just to like test my own limits and do some like, like to walk along, like, I don't know, the, a canal or even on the mountains, stuff like that. And it was really, really good for clearing my head and kind of like getting me out of the space. And whenever I come back to my desk and write again, I feel like my mind is so much clearer and I'm so much more like engaged and present. So, yeah. I saw someone mention Pokemon Go in the chat. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, I feel like I definitely got into Pokemon Go in 2020. <laughs> yeah. um, hiking, uh, I've also started to do, Ellen. Um, and there's just something about it when you, you don't have to hike, even just going outside, which like you said, I'm an indoor person as well. And I was like, wow, nature's great. You know, <laughs> like I'm bored at home. <laughs> this was here. So <laughs> it, that's a that's a very good point to bring up. And I do see a question um, from Emily in the chat that I missed earlier. Um, and they were asking um, if you all could maybe go over what your writing um, or creative routines or schedules are like, um, especially if you have a full time job. But obviously for everybody, because we all have full time lives. So. <laughs> I would not say that I can keep a schedule. <laughs> um, I definitely find I'm either more productive, like very early in the morning or way late at night, which depending on like, I'm usually working eight to four for my day job. So it's like, depending on when I can either before or after. Um, it, it's definitely hard getting a, any kind of schedule routine with writing. And then, you know, all the brain power that goes into the day job, like, kind of drains me by the time it's not done. So it's, it's definitely tricky. I kind of have to fit in writing stuff more so, like, when I get, like, a spark of, like, oh, yeah, I should, like, I really have this idea. I want to work on it and kind of pause whatever else I'm doing and jot it down and see if I can get back to it if I'm, you know, working or else if I'm not. And it's uh, trying to find the energy, I think, is like the hardest thing sometimes. Definitely. I also have trouble keeping to a schedule. Um, my day job is unfortunately pretty demanding, and I'm from like 6.30 to 3.30. <laughs> and mm. I'm definitely a morning person. Um, so... That that I mean that's that's my whole day right there is um so I I do try to carry a notebook and then like I said the scrap paper um just so I can jot stuff down when I've got a little bit of a break if if stuff is flowing otherwise a lot of stuff you know I either have to really carve out an evening at the beginning of the week and say okay Thursday night you know I'm going to sit down for an hour or two and work and I can't you know just relax and watch TV or something. Um, 
and then weekends. Unfortunately, all my errands have to happen on weekends. So it's just sort of like, you know, it's fitting in bits and pieces. It's fitting in an hour at a time. I'm luckily like I'm a pretty fast writer when I'm actually sitting down and doing it. So my output can be okay. But it is like I wish that I could have more of a stable schedule for it. I feel that. Yeah, um, does actually work freelance with like multiple like day jobs across different time zones. I am really, really bad at keeping schedule as well. And also, especially with multiple time zones, they have to like get up at 1 a.m., 2 a.m. just to have meetings. And so it was like, I have to write around these. And also because I was moving from London back home to Hong Kong for a while and had to stay three weeks in a tiny quarantine room for three weeks. So I had to find a way to like juggle everything, like including all my freelance day jobs. And also um, because I was studying at the time, I was um, still writing my dissertation. So I had to do that as well and write whenever I had the time for it. And so eventually I just kind of try to fit in some rain time between everything I had to do. Like I just write on scraps of paper whenever I have something I want to keep in from my brain because I'm really bad at keeping stuff in my brain. So yeah. Yeah. What's routine? What's the schedule? Never. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know them. <laughs> Just say it. <laughs> I I am I'm I I am very strongly ADHD and I acknowledge this. And I, I have the papers for it now and everything. And I'm like, oh, okay, I guess this is accurate. I guess it's real. <laughs> this explains so much about me, including why I have no set patterns whatsoever other than sleep too much, sleep too little. Hope I get some writing in between then. That's a mood. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I will tell you, you're you're all kind of echoing how I felt too, and it's uh, become a lot less pretentious about my writing process. I'll tell you that. <laughs> so I'm like, oh boy, you know, I got 50 words in, typed them on my phone. Nice. <laughs> I am winning today, you know. So um, <laughs> that's kind I'll of nice. in the back of my hand. Yeah. Well, yeah, I find that's nice, nice, like to not write it in the regular document, because then when you're transferring it, that's like an editing phase in and of itself. It's like, oh, I can tighten up this line here. Oh, I'm adding this thing here. So I write all of yeah. my poetry like longhand first so I can physically on the page to fuck around with like my, where my lines are going. Also, sorry for swearing, but um, I can mess around with where my, <laughs> you know, with like, you know, shaping the lines how I want to. And I, I do it for prose sometimes too, but um, I have double jointed fingers. So writing longhand for extended times can kind of mess with it, um, unfortunately. I have Evernote on my phone and on my laptop. So I, I find that I can write in snippets on the phone. And then when I transfer it over, it's like, oh yeah, it's kind of, it, it's handheld for like, oh yeah, I want to continue this a little bit more and get a few extra words in when I'm transferring. Also for those who write, you know, like have multiple projects going on and stuff all the time, which I generally don't because I I'm way too obsessive on something, but write in different fonts. And I don't know why, but that will like jar my brain a little bit. Um, like I, I like that trick. poetry in a different font than I do my fiction. It's total nonsense. I don't know why, but for some reason you're like, this is poetry font. Duh, that's that's just how we do it. Um, and I don't know, switching things back and forth will make, I don't know, just kind of shakes up your brain a little bit. And it's such a silly thing. I don't know. It's just not my view. But we do have a couple questions here. Oh, sorry, Dale. Go ahead. No, sorry. I say I don't do that, but I have like three or four different keyboards. Okay. <laughs> because it it kind of hits that same button in my brain of I am doing different thing on different keyboard for a different reason. Nice. Ooh. Probably a good way too, um, especially with a lot of people working from home lately. Like 
that's actually a really good point. Like this is the creative keyboard, you know, <laughs> and this mm -hmm. is the keyboard because you, for some people may have lost that. I go into office, I go into work mode, you know, so you have to change. And then that kind of makes those two places blend together. It can make your work space and then your creative space blend into one. Um, and that just stalls me out like no others. Mm -hmm. so, um, that's actually a super, super good tip. <laughs> Create a space now, you know, goodbye workspace. <laughs> Love that. Yeah. Speaking of keyboards, just like a couple of weeks ago, go upon this really, really old like typewriter at an, at a kind of like antique shop for five pounds. And I messed around with it and it still works. So I've been like, it's really, really slow, but I find slowness kind of helps in like making my brain slow down a bit and to like just probe around a bit, I guess. And like, you know, it's a vintage keyboard, like it's a vintage typewriter. It's definitely like, it's so cool. And I've been using it to write my like longer projects these days as an experiment. So yeah. There's something tactile and um, and so something so satisfying. I think uh, we lost Ellen slightly, but there's something so satisfying about the feel of a typewriter key. So I absolutely agree with that. Um, got a few other questions here um, on the chat that I thought I'd throw your all way. Um, there you are. <laughs> you popped out for a sec, Ellen. <laughs> all right, so. We have a question from Allison that said, I have a lot of mentions of dice and tabletop RPG character sheets. How do you find the creativity involved in tabletop RPGs or other creative hobbies um, interacts with the energy levels and motivation for fiction writing? Does burnout extend to everything or does playing um, help stoke the fires for fiction? Gosh, you should have been the moderator. That's a question. <laughs> That's a great question. That's a great question. <laughs> Uh, I, I find, well, I've definitely, I love video games. So, uh, le recently I've been like, <laughs> now like 80 hours or something into, uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. And it really kind of stokes that like, it's, it's a lot of fun to play. And then there's also just enough, like various narrative threads that kind of like get my brain going. So I find it is both inspiring to play and helps kind of like recharge my batteries for like when I want to do other creative projects. And I've, uh, I've found that, um, when I am feeling burned out, it does kind of extend to, I don't really want to do anything, but if I can manage to either watch a narrative TV show or play some games for a little bit, it kind of helps elevate the, the burnout enough to like start getting the recharge process going again. I feel you on Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Yes. I love that game. It's nominally like a stealth game, but it doesn't really reward you for being stealthy, which is great because right. I'm absolutely garbage at being oh, stealthy. Oh, same. <laughs> <laughs> Just go stealth. But um, as far as tabletop goes, I play D&D &D and I'm also playing a Monster of the Week game right now. And I um, shamefully am like, should I do a podcast? No. <laughs> the market is saturated. But I, I find that um that sort of creativity of just being in the head of one character because I, I'm not DMing. I'm a little bit too, I think, uptight too. Because if the players don't do what I want them to, then the, the wrath of God will rain down upon them. Uh, <laughs> that's not fun. Uh, so um, channeling my creative energy into that and really getting into the head of a character and, and, you know, sort of collaborative play is really fun. I do think it both charges and drains the battery. I'm an introvert, so it drains the battery that way. But then I also have a lot of things that I'm thinking of in terms of like, you know, story beats and character depth and, and you know, reading other players. So I think I think it can be a really fun sort of like psychological exercise of, you know, understanding exercise. And I really believe in like the power of community for creativity. So 
doing things collaboratively, doing things with other people, even just writing in the same room as another person who's doing, you know, their own art, whether it's writing or my partner, like paints and makes furniture. He's crazy. Um, he's he, um, he's a he's a real Renaissance man, but uh, <laughs> it's it's that sort of community, as, as especially with how isolating the pandemic has been is I think really important and helpful, even if it's just virtually. Like it's so nice to see all of you. Yes. It's strange as um as a fellow introvert, which I would wager many sorts of creatives in this space are who spend a lot of time in our own brains. Um how much you miss that kind of ancillary, um, I don't know, I call it like my peripheral socialization in a way. It's like, I went to the grocery store, there were humans there. I did it, you know? <laughs> um, so these types of things are so important and that's why it's so wonderful that like Flights of Boundary does this so we can all connect, you know, cause um, you know, Ellen, you're in a, are you in Hong Kong right now? Uh, no, I'm in London right now. Yeah. In London, you know, yeah. so. You know, like, this is amazing. You know, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. So, you know, that's, that, that's a good point, Maria, that you made about this kind of, you know, recharge in a way. But anybody else have anything to say about video games or gaming in general or? Nope. Yeah, um, I've also been playing D&D &D and I just started my first campaign about several, like, a couple of months ago. And I find it really, really helps in kind of like, because, I don't know, because d, d is such a different genre from what I write usually, even though it's also fantasy and sci-fi, like I also write fantasy and sci-fi. And so it kind of helps like make me think about characters and narrative in a way that I don't usually do. And also our games master is really, really amazing at doing stuff like really, really deep character stuff, which I admire so much and really, really am jealous of in a way I want to put in my own writing. And so it's been such a wonderful experience in like learning how D and D works and learning from the other players as well. And I love the collaborative element of it and kind to like, it's basically a whole like several hours of just like being yourself, being someone else and getting to stab things and like having a bit of a catharsis is really, really good sometimes. So, yeah. Play any tabletop or anything like that, Bill? I do not actually. Um, I don't need that. D and D gives me anxiety sometimes. Just the idea of not knowing everything, how to play it, and I can't read the rule books. I feel so. that I'm extreme. I'm a extremely bad D and D player. I make the group of my friends who I play with basically explain all the rules to me, and I avoid rolling as much as possible. I have sort of a thought with myself of, can I get through like an hour of a session without the DM saying I have to roll for that? Like, can, <laughs> how much chaos can I cause? So. <laughs> I, I definitely feel that. Played once with my um, husband and my siblings, and I'm not allowed to play anymore. So, <laughs> um, did you break the DM? What? Did you break the DM? <laughs> uh, well, it was my husband, so a little bit. <laughs> it's because he was. Uh, this is off topic. Sorry, but I'm the moderator. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, he was uh, uh, not happy with my attitude. But anyway, back to the panel. Um, I will, we had another question here. Um, what inspires you and your writings or your creative pursuits? And, you know, you know, a, a little tag along, has that changed since, you know, the pandemic or et cetera, so forth? You know, that's my add on to it. <laughs> It's uh, a lot of deep questions. Sorry, I'm dropping my <laughs> cast okay. them on you, kind of like, what's your news? And you're like, oh my gosh, it's six in the morning or whatever time. <laughs> I mean, can I counter with a deep answer? Yes, 
please. Send a deep answer. Okay. Um, so in the past two years, I've been doing a lot of trauma processing and part of that involved my cat's tail being in my face. But beyond that, um, Morticia, come on. Sorry, but I've been doing a lot of trauma processing and uh, I've been doing a lot of that through fiction and actually I am terrified for a story that's going to come out at Pseudopod at some point because it is one of my big processing stories and I'm very excited to found a home, but also, oh, that hurt a lot. So like that's that's a lot of my inspiration is just kind of working through my own personal shit half the time and doing it through speculative elements and horror elements and throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what happens and oh look that looks like a blood stain I wonder why. Um I've actually found uh listening and reading to nonfiction has really helped inspire uh my writing in the last couple of years, just I hear these really cool random facts that I would never have thought to like look up or research at any point. It's just like, oh, that's shiny. I'm going to collect that and put it in my story somewhere. Um, yeah, so uh, like a lot of nonfiction and then um, like for me, definitely video games. I, I, I get a lot of inspiration out of playing a wide variety. Um, so, because I also work in theater, I, um, I devise theater as well in both Hong Kong and in London. So, um, I find that engaging theater and also collaborative theater has really been inspiring for me in terms of like just one around ideas and generating new ideas. <laughs> oh, sorry, distracted. Oh, sorry. Yeah, he wants snacks and he, yeah. he has to yeah. wait. Oh my god, he looks like our Milo. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. He kind of looks like our cat. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, theater definitely. And um, I also really like certain history, especially local history, because like, I find that, like, especially in London, if you just like walk around town for like half an hour, you get to learn all the things about all the history and um, kind of like able to get so much inspiration, so many different stories. And so they have been really, really inspiring for me. Yeah. Um I'm definitely with with uh, Vale um, as far as uh, both trauma processing and also using speculative elements for it. Um, and I, I go even a step further. A lot of my work recently has been with um, like fairy tale or mythology retellings because that's like another sort of layer to the exoskeleton that I'm building around myself to process. Um, I've tried writing I fiction. Understand. It does not work well for me because it's like it can be too hard to look things in the eye directly. And so I, I use the specul I layer the speculative elements and then I layer sort of like the fairy tale because then you have sort of this pre-built plot, these pre-built characters that you can really sort of tease the emotions and the depth out of and that can feel kind of safer. But I also think it can still be powerful. I definitely I've been trying to open myself up more to like, I don't know, the rawness a little bit. And I, I've been producing some stuff that I think is really good and I should probably send out on submissions soon. But I'm bad about that sometimes. Hello, may I encourage you because fairy tale and mythology retellings are my jam. And I just wrote trauma an, through them are yes. I wrote an Antigone one. Antigone, I read it in <gasps> high school. I had a, I had a very weird high school um where we did uh like Greek and Roman mostly, like classical stuff. Um mm -hmm. and Antigone is the sort of thing that just stuck in my brain since I was like 13 and I wrote like um uh Mars Western Antigone that I really like. And um it's definitely the most like trauma story I've ever written. <laughs> <laughs> but 
That sounds delightful, though. Like, no offense. No, none, no offense whatsoever. Your trauma is not delightful. But... No, no, I, I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> I do like how it's a... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I wrote this ex incredibly traumatic thing, and I love it. And I was like, that sounds delightful. And I know you just said it, but I, only I this would we all understand <laughs> what you meant. Like, not one of us went, oh, my goodness. We didn't what you meant. So it does sound delightful. <laughs> um, Quickly throw up those disclaimers and move on. Yeah. yeah we know, we know. Um, really great question here. I'm telling you, I think Allison was the one who asked the last one. She should have been the moderator. How do you get back to the of things when you're just coming out of burnout and still feeling very rusty? And just keep in mind also, this is kind of our five minute mark to before we wrap up, but that's, I thought was a really good question we should throw out there. Flash fiction, tiny stories, itty bitty things. Inconsequential things, basically. Poetry. Warning pages. Fan fiction. Warning pages. And a lot of that um, poetry is my go to when um, when I can't fiction um, or and other reason I don't it's not like my backup or anything but you know I do small stories things that you can complete in the sitting um, or you know stuff like that it's all really good advice so anyone else have anything to add I have kind of a one final question if um, Journaling, I see. Good, I, yeah. Journaling is really good. Um, so, my last question, I think, since we have um, a few uh, few minutes left, is if you could give your pre-pandemic or pre-whatever um, self any advice, what would that be? To get don't be scared. Huh? Don't be scared. Be cautious, but don't be scared. Like, that's kind of what it comes right down to for me is a lot of things happen around me because I'm afraid of them or I don't do things because I'm afraid and I do do other things because I'm afraid. But fear also messes a lot of things up, including the ability to create. And if you can be cautious but not be scared, you're a lot better off. I think that's I like that. excellent advice. Yeah, I love that. I think that I would say be gentle with yourself. I'm someone who is, you know, if I came at a problem, I just sort of, you know, go straight through the wall kind of thing. Um, the Kool-Aid man coping mechanism. Um, there's only so, there's more walls in the world than I have, you know, muscles to burn through them. And when it stops working, like with this pandemic, you know, it, it can feel very difficult and it can feel like failure and it can become burnout because you're pushing yourself so hard. So, um, you know, I wish I had learned to take care of myself, you know, mentally and physically earlier than this, but I'm, I'm trying. Yeah. Um, honestly, I would say that if I could tell my previous self, it'd be like, uh, invest in like the, the ergonomic, like tools. Like I just got a new mattress, um, a standing desk. Uh, these things are important for your health and, uh, you are definitely worth in having these things to take care of yourself. Definitely also like taking care of your health because like since the pandemic I've been far more aware of how my health impacts my everyday life. And so it's something I'd ignored most of my life until the pandemic hit. So yeah, at least sooner is better than later. So yeah. That's all very, very poignant and probably applies to most of us. Um, take care of yourself. <laughs> Essentially, silly, you haven't been doing it. So, and I can definitely vouch for that. So, um, we basically have like one minute left. Was there anything else? Um, you know, anyone wanted to a shout out to the ether <laughs> of 
to to anybody watching here? Um, I just think that yeah, we have a like the sci-fi community can definitely has its issues, but it's also a community that has been really supportive of of like me and a lot of other people, and I think that that's been a super a super good uh, life jacket, kind of just you know when everything is falling apart, having that community there has been awesome. So thank you all. Thank you all for being here, and um, this I feel like this was a really good talk and a lot of really really excellent questions from our chat here. Coming in clutch. Thank you. You guys are producing. So thank you, everyone. You all had wonderful answers. It was lovely to speak to all of you. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of Flights of Foundry. And I, you know, hopefully we run into each other again throughout this conference. So well, thank you all. This this has been great. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you, everyone. This is great to meet you and thanks to everybody. Asking awesome <laughs> questions. <laughs> yeah. All right.